Hello and welcome to The Daily Space for today, February 7th, February 7th, 2019. I am your host, Dr. Pamela Gay, and I am here to put science in your brains. Uh, we have a lot of cool news for today. It seems that the uh, science machine is finally back up and working full steam ahead after the disjointed start that we had to the beginning of our year. This today's news comes from well all over our solar system and beyond. Let's start by stepping out into the depths of space. In new news coming to us from the Gaia spacecraft, scientists using Data Release 2 have been able to well map together, mosaic together a more detailed understanding of the brightness density of our sky than has ever been done before. In this image, what you see is star upon star, blob of gas upon blob of gas, each mapped out in amazing precision. Using this data, astronomers have not just been able to study the stars, but they have also looked at what's going on with the intergalactic gas. And this is the gas that appears between our galaxy and other galaxies. They've also looked very precisely at the motions of the stars. Putting all of this together, they have begun to map out an entirely new understanding of how these galaxies are moving around one another and exactly what our future may be. Now, our Milky Way galaxy is gravitationally held together with the Andromeda galaxy, the Triangulum galaxy, a host of small dwarf spheroidal and dwarf irregular galaxies. And all of these different systems are orbiting one another, sort of like how stars in a globular cluster orbit together around one another. We share a central uh, gravitational center and... Um, as we move, slowly but surely, gravitational interactions have the potential to cause these systems to come together and coalesce, which is a fancy word for come together, hit each other, and become new objects. And this is exactly the fate that our Milky Way galaxy and the Andromeda galaxy have for themselves. Using this new data from Galaxy, we've been able to get a better understanding of exactly how we're going to collide with Andromeda. In this image, image, what you see are individual circles, blue for the Milky Way, green for the Triangulum Galaxy, and red for the Andromeda Galaxy. These circles each map out the current location of these galaxies in this particular cut through our group of galaxies. Um, over time, all three of these systems are going to move. And here you can see that Triangulum's like, I'm just going to stay out of the way. I'm just going to orbit out here. And so it's going around the much larger combined mass of the Milky Way and the Andromeda, which are going to come together and merge in about five and a half billion years. So don't worry about seeing this anytime soon. In fact, our sun is slated to come to an end about the same time our galaxy loses its individual identity. So five and a half billion years from now is going to be a pretty interesting time <sighs> and we don't get to see it but we can see it in our computer models and we can understand what's going to happen and this is one of the really cool things about science is it lets us see what will be using well physics. So this is cool this is what you can do with computers, telescopes, and a whole lot of math. So moving a little bit closer to home, but not too close, we have a tale of two blue orbs. These are Uranus on the left and Neptune on the right. These two spacecraft have never really gotten explored the way many of us would like to see them explored as the two outermost known worlds in our solar system. They have been visited by flyby and that's it. They've never had an orbiter. And one of the reasons they've never had an orbiter is it's just hard to hang a left when you get to Neptune. When we send spacecraft out to the outer worlds, we, we are impatient. 
we give them a whole lot of velocity in hopes that they'll get there quickly within the academic research lifetime of the people who put together the mission. And for that to happen, they have to be going really fast. And to take them from that extraordinarily fast velocity into an orbital velocity requires a very large change in velocity. This is called a delta V in rocket terms. And the amount of fuel needed to do that is a lot. So the better way to get to Neptune or Uranus is to send a spacecraft on a multi-year slow meandering journey that will go hither and yon, visit other worlds, take gravity assists, and eventually get there. But we're impatient. I think I mentioned that. And, and so we haven't done this yet. So we haven't really gotten to explore these worlds. And unfortunately, when the Voyager mission flew past Uranus, that ball on the left, it was winter on Uranus. And Uranus is one of these worlds where instead of being upright relative to the sun like Earth is, it is turned so that its rotational axis is in the plane of the solar system. Now, this doesn't mean that its pole is always pointed towards the sun. In fact, sometimes its pole is pointed towards the sun. Sometimes its side, side is pointed towards the sun. And as it goes around, so let's imagine that my microphone for a moment is the sun. As it goes around, it stays constantly oriented relative to the stars. And this means sometimes that pole is pointed at an odd angle relative to the sun and you start to get amazing seasonal variations. And that's what's going on in this picture where we're seeing, well, a seasonal transition and massive storms arising on this blue world. Now, those sto storms are most likely made up of frozen ice particles. This is what gives ice giants their names. These are very, very gassy worlds with icy storms. Now, on the right in this image, what you see is Neptune. It, too, has all sorts of cool storms. So if you want to see really cool changing weather patterns, these are the worlds to visit but you have to be patient to get there if you want to orbit. Now, at this time, there are no missions funded to go to these worlds. There are no missions in development to go to these worlds. There are a lot of scientists proposing to go to these worlds. And this means, as a 45-year-old scientist, I have to admit, we're probably not going to get to these worlds in my academic lifetime. But here's to hoping that that next generation will get to explore these planets. <sighs> Such is life. Now, our next tale comes to us from a new uh, telescope named after one of the oddest individuals to become famous in astronomy. This would be Fritz Zwicky, who is the namesake of the new uh, Caltech Zwicky Transit Telescope or facility. Fritz Zwicky is known for many things. He is one of the original people to notice dark matter along with Vera Rubin. He is also the person who coined the phrase circular bastard to describe someone who's a bastard from all sides and angles. Now, despite being a bit of a crank and a curmudgeon, he was also an amazing observational astronomer. He was one of the first people to map out in detail all the different ways that galaxies can appear deformed on the sky as they interact and collide with one another. Now, with this new transit facility that has been named after him, they aren't just studying these distant galaxies. They are, in fact, also taking on cool things like asteroids that don't do the things we expect. Now, a transit telescope is one that looks, or rather a transient telescope, um, is, is one that looks for things that go flicker, flare, 
and move in the night. These are transient phenomena. So they're not there all the time is what that word means. And this particular facility is using the classic Palomar telescope. This is a telescope that is uh, built with a Schmidt design. If any of you have a Schmidt Cassegrain telescope in your closet or garage, this is that kind of a telescope, just big. And this particular telescope with its massive field of view is night after night looking for all these objects that, as I said, flicker, flare, and move in the sky. And one of the things they found is an asteroid behaving in ways that we hadn't previously seen asteroids behaving. This particular rock is in orbit around our solar system, and it's not confining itself to the same plane in the sky where planets are normally located. Instead, as is depicted in this image, it is popping up above the plane, then diving beneath the whole time, keeping its distance from the sun to within the distance that Venus travels from the sun. We have never previously found an asteroid that has its entire orbit internal to that of Venus. So this particular, what they're calling a rare species discovered in the cosmic wild, hints at, well, there are places that we're not looking and we should be looking for asteroids. So here is to more amazing discoveries. Now, the thing about this telescope, this facility, this wiki transient facility, is it's not just finding asteroids. In fact, this particular system has so far well, it's found 50 near-Earth objects, but it's also found more than 1,000 supernova and other nova in the sky. In fact, um, one of these things that it has found is a white dwarf that is, well, pulling matter off of its companion star. And I'm showing you this not because that's unusual or unique or particularly exciting, but because they did one heck of a really good artist's rendition of what's going on. In this particular graphic, this particular illustration, this is not a photo. What we're seeing is um, they have begun to understand from all of their observations of supernova and all of their uh, observations of transient phenomena a more detail they have gained a more detailed understanding of how white dwarf stars go from being well moon-sized stars to being solar system sized explosions in this artist's depiction we see a white dwarf star pulling matter off of a nearby companion object creating an accretion disk, that disk of material that forms as it sheds off its angular momentum. That disk grows, material in the disk falls onto the white dwarf star, and eventually the whole thing goes boom. It just goes boom. This is what happens. And uh, we look forward to seeing just what happens as they continue to do all of their new science. Now, this is, as I said, a new facility built on an old telescope. Um, and I just love seeing old facilities given entirely new life. Now, that is all the science I've got for today. Um, I will now go ahead and take your questions. And while you type those into the chat, and I'm going to remind you to at me as you do this, um, I'm also going to remind you that we are part of CosmoQuest. The Daily Space comes to you most Mondays through Fridays. And uh, we are a production of the Planetary Science Institute working in collaboration with Youngstown State University. We are here to bring you a daily dose of science and news. And in the coming weeks, we are looking to expand our repertoire. As we did yesterday, we're going to start bringing you in-depth looks at new instruments, new telescopes and facilities, and even old ones that have really cool science that it's worth reviewing. Uh, yesterday, I lied to you, however, when I said we were going to be doing that on Wednesdays. Thank you, Ta Tom Van Scooter, for the subscription. Thank you so much. Um, it turns out that uh, 
there are seminars I really want to attend on Wednesdays. So most Wednesdays, we're going to have our own Binary Blaze, Annie Wilson, bringing you the news. I am going to be doing in-depth looks on Tuesdays. So come back on Tuesdays and I will be announcing probably tomorrow what next Tuesday's highlights are going to be. Now, uh, in addition to doing the Daily Space, 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, 6 p.m. London time, we also bring you launches, landings, special events, news conferences, all as they happen. We're also going to start bringing in a questions show. Um, so stay tuned as we grow what we have to offer. The month of February is really a transition month for CosmoQuest as we start getting all of our staff back under contract, getting re-employed at the Planetary Science Institute. All thanks to you. We are here because of you. Your donations, your subscriptions, everything you do to support us allows us to keep being here. So thank you for your bits, your subs, your Patreon donations. Thank you. Anna, uh, I hope we make you proud with everything we produce. Now, if you happen to miss an episode here on Twitch, uh, you can catch us over on YouTube. And, you know, if you could click on over to YouTube and click subscribe, it would really help us pop up in the search. Now, if you happen to be watching us on YouTube, well, we are on Twitch and you can ask questions over there. Speaking of questions, I'm going to see what all you have to ask. I just need to find where I hid that particular window on my screen. Um, <laughs> Mike Cassidy, yes. Yay for employment. Um, thank you, Trekker Kev. Thank you so much. Um, so, so yes, um, thank you humans. Um, okay, scrolling. Thank you, Veronica Cure for the bits. Um, so extra dimensional space uh, has a question related to dark matter. Uh, they recently read that dark energy can actually be twin spin particles of neutrons. And I'm really curious what you think is dark matter. I think we don't know. Um, there are currently lots of theorists with lots of ideas, and I think the theories may outnumber the theorists. We just don't have enough data. So I'm going to stay tuned and wait for an idea that makes a prediction and the observations that meet that prediction. Um, okay, so the Raven Lillian is saying, did they get the telescope on Hubble fixed or have there been any updates on that since the shutdown? My understanding is ACX is up and working again. Um, I haven't seen any details on it, but no news is usually good news. So I think everything is up and functioning. Um, scrolling back. So Larry is saying, won't the large Magellanic cloud merge with us before Andromeda does? We used to think that, Larry. What's cool about science, though, is sometimes as we get new and better data, we have to completely update our understanding of things. It turns out that our original thought was since Andromeda, not Andromeda, since the large Magellanic cloud and the small Magellanic cloud are so close to, to our own Milky Way galaxy, they must be on a path to collide, a path to merge with us. But it turns out we were completely wrong. LMC, we now think, and again, we could be proven wrong later as our data still continues to improve, but it looks like the Arch Magellanic Cloud is going to just do a drive-by passage, kind of like the asteroid Oumuamua did as it passed through the solar system. If this is our Milky Way galaxy, the Large Magellanic Cloud is flying in, it's going to circle around and then just continue flying back on out on a hyperbolic trajectory. So um, enjoy LMC while we've got it. I think we've got a couple more billion years for it to be this nearby. So let's scroll up and see what else is up here. Um, so string theory, I'm trying to figure out what what you're asking um so so okay i finally backed up enough so string theory is asking to go to neptune and uranus might be 
deferred to the 22nd century. That's true. So, so the issue is you want to get to both planets. You need to have them aligned in the solar system. And planets have this nasty habit of moving their orbiting. The, the Voyager missions took advantage of a very unique time in our solar system that allowed them to go on a low energy trajectory that bounced them from world to world, visiting planet after planet after planet. That kind of alignment was literally a once in a lifetime phenomena, a once in a century or multiple centuries, it appears, phenomena. Now, to get to just one of the worlds, we just have to wait for Earth in that world to be aligned. And since the Earth is moving kind of quickly, this is the kind of thing that happens year after year after year. Now, we still don't have the money to go to just one of these two worlds and get into orbit. It is what it is. Um, So microfusion is not a thing. That's not a pow power source at the moment. Um, okay, so I'm going to scroll back to the bottom and I'm going to ask if you have any additional questions. Um, please at me. It makes everything so much easier to find when you at me. Um, <laughs> hey, Super Cowboy, it is. Is it even morning in Oz? Um, I want to say it's late last night. Um, yeah, or I guess late tonight for me, but last night for you. Uh, planetary rotation is, is really hard on a human. Um, so Extra Dimensional Space is saying, what is your answer for the Fermi Paradox? And do you think there can be aliens existing just that they are in different dimensions? So we actually did an entire episode of the Astronomy Cast podcast on the Fermi Paradox. And I'd encourage you to go check that out and get 30 minutes all on that one topic. Um, <laughs> and Dave Killian's uh, Klingon or virus. I like the way you put it. I'm pretty sure that there's going to be bacteria, microbes, prions, something tiny out there. Maybe even like sea anemones on Titan, not Titan, sea anemones on Enceladus, on Europa. It's intelligence that I suspect is really rare. But as I said, go check out our, our episode of Astronomy Cast, where we go into this for 30 minutes. Um, okay, thank you, Susie, for your rapid fire finding on that. That's awesome. Um, okay, do we have any other questions? Um, oh, failure to add, but noble attempt, Noel. I will go ahead and answer that. If gravitational attraction is the result of objects moving straight relative to the curve of space-time, how is it that objects at a given altitude and traveling initially along the same vector will follow different paths given different speeds? Mm. You can figure this out using a large salad bowl. I have no bowls. So, so if you um, have a large salad bowl that's nice and not super steep sided, you can put a marble on the side and you can give it different speeds and see that some speeds will cause it to go flying around and up the side of the bowl. Some will cause it to spin down into the bowl and others will cause it to go on nearly a circle around the inside of the bowl. So you start with the exact same direction, but because you have a different velocity, the, the ability of gravity to affect you over time and it's force over time that is changing you. Um, gravity has that ability to pull you in or allow you to, well, escape out the side. Um, so I encourage you to go play with salad bowls and marbles. And just to warn you, this is a really good way to lose your marbles. So maybe do this on carpet so they don't roll quite so far. Um, looking to see what else you ask. Um, so extra dimensional space. We also have astronomy cast episodes on both dark matter and dark energy. So for these kinds of individual questions, um, they really require more than a quick answer. 
And Astronomy Cast is a really great place for you to go look up many of these different ideas. Um, <laughs> Paranor, you can always go buy new marbles. They just may not be as good as the original fact factory installed ones. Um, yeah, don't try this in a department store, String Theory. That is true. Um, so, so the thing about straight relative to the surface of the bowl is every velocity is instantaneously straight. And, and so that inside of the bowl is simulating the effects of gravity, which is a constant field, a constant push inwards. And it's replicating the geometric way of looking at the shape of space. So if you were able to look at a small enough moment in time in our own solar system, everything moves in a straight line. It's just forces that are constantly moving those straight lines to make them curved. So instantaneously, you have a straight velocity in that bowl. It's just only for an instant. Um, so I, I understand what you're saying about the geodesic. Um, that's because you probably aren't using a spherical bowl that simulates a geodesic, um, cause I don't think they make bowls in that shape. Um, you can set it up like that. It just requires, um, being super precise in how you hammer the marble. When they do this in museums where they do set things up with perfect spheres, they actually have a cutout that allows a marble to be fired in from the side at different velocities. Um, that way you do get the force completely perpendicular to the surface of the bowl guaranteed. It's harder to do it with your hands. Um, but unless your local museum happens to have one of those setups, the best you're going to do is a salad bowl. Um, so Super Cowboy, yes, you can ask a quick question. Um, it's CosmoQuest X, though. That's OK. Um, if the moon was not tidally locked to the Earth, would it still have the effect on the Earth? Yes. And in fact, the, the tidal locking that we see, we see today. But were we able to go back 3 billion years ago to shortly after the moon had formed, First of all, everything would be molten and hot and deadly. We don't want to do that. Um, but we would have seen the moon rotating. The moon took time to become tidally locked. Now, the tides on the Earth are arised by the moon. But the Earth is what's rising in the tides on the moon. And the fact that the moon is tidally locked is because of the Earth. And the fact that we have tides on the Earth has to do with the moon's gravity, not its rotation. Now, where the rotation of the two worlds comes into play is our Earth used to be rotating a whole lot faster. And over time, as the moon moved away, as the moon slowed down, as the Earth slowed down, all of these things are results of conservation of angular momentum. So as the moon moves away, the earth slows down with the tidal locking that also causes it to move outwards. Um, again, astronomy cast, we talk about this, it's cool. Um, okay. Also did, I think an episode on quantum entanglement. Um, it's 1230. You're starting to ask lots of basic physics questions instead of news related questions. I need to go do my work. I'm sorry. I'm going to disappear for today. I will set aside a day that I can do longer when I can answer all of your basic science questions, or at least some of your basic science questions. Um, otherwise, I would be here forever forever, essentially verbally teaching you an Astro 101 textbook. Um, so I'm going to take off as all my notifications go off across everything. Um, and I will see you tomorrow. I am going to find something, someone to raid. I am going to roll the credits. And I am going 
to wish all of you a fabulous morning, evening, afternoon, middle of the night. I'm looking at you, Australia. And um, if the weather is good, go outside and look up. And I will see you all on the other side. <laughs> Bye-bye.